Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. Clap your hands to the Lord. Come on, give Him praise. Give Him some loud praise. He is worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Let's say that name that is above every name. Jesus. How many believe He's the King of kings and Lord of lords? How many believe Jesus is the Almighty God manifest in the flesh? Say that name again. Jesus. How many believe that there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we, whereby we must is an imperative, whereby we must be saved. In Christ alone, the poet said, in Christ alone, I've placed my trust. Well, now, if you really believe that, you have just isolated yourself from most of the politicians of the world. You have certainly insulted academia and the intellectual community. And you've made a lot of Islamic folks pretty upset. And Hollywood, Barbara Streisand is probably not real excited about this camp meeting tonight. And who is she? Thank you. Somebody said that up here. I didn't say that. I think it was, I think it was Brother Beckton that said that, wasn't it? No. <laughs> but just to make the devil mad, let's say it again, that name. Jesus. Come on, say it with some gusto. Jesus. Oh, how precious is that name. Haven't we been having a great service tonight? Wow. I think we ought to put our hands together and thank Texas Bible College, these young people, and that wonderful help they've been to this service. And then all those old folks that joined them, some of them were pretty good. And, uh, wow, that was amazing. That was a great, great medley. I enjoyed it. My heart was lifted up. We thank the Lord for that. Your district is to be complimented for all the tremendous things that you've done through the years. Missions, providing us tremendous leadership and a great example of enthusiasm and commitment and bravery. And this wonderful tabernacle and these campgrounds which have been part of the Pentecostal history of North America. So many marvelous and wonderful things have happened here, and the best is yet to come. And you are to be complimented for investing time, effort, and fortune into your Bible college, helping to train young men and women to get ready for the greatest revival that has ever been. It's coming to pass, and we need young men and women that are committed to ministry. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but I would rather for our kids to be ministers than to be karate champions or soccer champions or doctors or lawyers or prominent businessmen so let's encourage them it's not for everybody to be a preacher but we ought to be encouraging young people that want to be involved in the ministry so I thank this district for what you're doing and helping to train young men and women for the ministry the president of Purdue University Purdue University of course has trained more American astronauts than any other university in America. It has trained not only that, uh, but many technicians and uh, engineers from all around the world. It's a fantastic school. But recently, the president, about maybe four years ago now, shocked the, uh, and he's still the current president, shocked the entire university on uh, graduation night when he said, that the future of the world belongs to philosophers, theologians, and preachers. He said, because it doesn't matter how much we get involved in technology, unless men have the right ethics, the right morals, a sense of righteousness, technology will only be a path to doom. So even though he said, and I'm paraphrasing him, of course, 
This university is committed to all this technology and engineering and space exploration and DNA, D, DNA, D, yeah, you know what I mean. He said the future really belongs to theologians, philosophers, and preachers. That's why your work at Texas Bible College is so important. So thank God for these wonderful students and this great staff because it is people that have a grip on the will of God that are going to make a difference in this world. Thank you for letting me be with you, Brother Prince. Thank you so much. And, of course, it's good to be with our good district superintendent from California. What a fantastic lesson. Did you enjoy that today from Brother Mullen? Wow. you got to get a copy of that. Thank you, Brother David Elms, for preaching to us in such a fantastic way. And what a powerful point you made today. And I do give honor to Brother Williams and to Brother Beckton and to all the ministers and district board and all of you and the ministers. All the ministers and their wives out in the audience. Stick up your hand. Just wave at us a little bit. Do you appreciate these good godly people? Give them a great big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now you may be seated. Isn't that the best four words in Pentecost? You may be seated. I, I promised Brother Christian, and I want to do this, that I would uh, re-recommend uh, the couple books that I recommended at the General Conference. One is by James Martin, who wrote a book a few years ago called The Wired Society. It's not a Christian book, but it's a very interesting book. And I'm going to read the cover as part of my sermon tonight, just the cover, little cover text here. But this is a really great book for ministers, The Meaning of the 21st Century, and I do recommend it. You're going to be blessed by it. And then, last night I alluded to the great revival uh, in Africa, and this is the book called The New Faces of Christianity, written by Philip Jenkins, which uh, helps you to understand from a very broad context. This is not a Pentecostal book. It is a Christian book, but not a Pentecostal book. But it demonstrates and documents the fact that the reason there is such a fantastic move of God, and that cannot be denied. You just talk to any of our uh, missionaries in the southern hemisphere, whether it's in South America or Africa, and they'll tell you that there's a great outpouring of the Spirit. In Latin America, for an example, there are thousands of people, 8,000 people a day that are leaving the Catholic Church. The, the Pope has been so alarmed about this through the years and Pope Benedict has picked up this challenge from his uh, uh, his uh, from the former Pope and they are broadcasting 24 hours a day in Latin America to try to stop the hemorrhaging of the Catholic Church. Of those 8,000 a day that are leaving the Catholic Church, over 70 some percent of them, about 78 or 79 percent are converting to Christianity and of those 79 percent, 50 7 or 58 percent are converting to Pentecostalism. And among those that are converting to Pentecostalism, many of them are being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. So there's something happening in the world. So those two books I recommend. Now let's come to the Word of the Lord for a little while. And we're going to go to 1 Samuel. I often say to students, uh, you know, maybe you should pick some other chapter in the Bible to preach from. Besides 1 Samuel chapter 17, which is the story, of course, of David uh, and uh, Goliath. And uh, because it's, it's uh, preached about so much that one could argue that it's almost worn out. On the other hand, uh, what would a camp meeting be if at least one preacher didn't preach on David and Goliath? So, here we go. I want to try... Now, you're standing for the reading of the Word... So, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to stand for the entire sermon. Because we're not, we're not going to take a text. So, but just because you stood and I respect you, I'll read a text for you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, let's see. Would you like to pick one? Alright. Our text will be from the first verse of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Everybody say the first word. Now. You may be seated. Now, uh, now. <laughs> By the way, it's always nice to have my lovely wife here. And so since I'm dealing with the entire chapter of 1 Samuel chapter 17, where are you at, Mickey? God bless you. 
Uh, could we check your cough out? Very good. She does that long about 40 minutes. And you want to make sure that's working. <clears throat> that's why I walk over there occasionally just to see if I'm getting the cough or the time out sign or the cut it off sign or the eyes that said, I'll kill you when I get you home. I, I know all of those. And if I get to an hour and 15 minutes, she's got her cell phone out calling her attorney seeking a divorce. So she keeps me in control. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a tremendous story. And you worked with me so well last night because we dealt with a certain portion of Scripture allegorically. And that means that you can take the example of Scripture and apply it to your life, to your ministry, to your church, and to perhaps your situation. And I want to ask you to do that with me again tonight because I do believe that we're at a crisis point in the world. And I want Brother Beckton to get ready to just pray for this poor preacher and to pray for all of us that you can receive from this preacher tonight a few little remarks and comments about where we're at and how we need to face some of the situations that we're up against in the 21st century. Humanity, this is going to be from the cover now of the meaning of the 21st century. I didn't know I was going to have this in hand, so I'm kind of blessed because it fits what I want to talk to you about tonight. Humanity is at a turning point, James Martin argues, in this provocative and prophetic new book. We are facing a profound transition, unique in human history. As a species, we are traveling at a breakneck speed into an era of extremes, extremes of wealth and poverty, extremes in technology, extremes in weapons, extremes in globalism. If we are to survive, we must learn how to manage them all. Now, that is not unlike what the armies of God and David more specifically and Saul, this whole, this whole menagerie of men who were facing, confronting an enemy, confronting a situation that was very uh, perplexing, very difficult, very ominous, much like what we are facing today. And so we're going to explore it. Now, three things you've got to look for. I won't be dwelling on this, but three things were happening to David. Three things that David brought to the table. Three things that David instituted into the consciousness. You remember David was described at the point of his death as the man that brought enlightenment or brought vision or revelation to the people of God. And they feared even his death because they were afraid that they would lose the light of Israel. And toward the end of his life they wouldn't even hardly let him get out of bed because they were trying to preserve him for as long as they could. But in the 17th chapter, we see David in three great struggles. And it's what I want to talk to you about. First of all, he had to come on the scene and to challenge not only himself, but to God's people, not to let the enemy define reality. You cannot let the world define reality. We can't let the world tell us what we ought to do. How we ought to rear our children or how we ought to preach in our pulpits, or how we ought to walk, and how we ought to talk, and how we ought to dress. That is not the world's business. That definition belongs to this book right here called the Bible. Somebody say amen. Turn to somebody and say, the world must not set our definition of reality. And that's what the good president of Purdue University was trying to say. We need philosophers, theologians, and preachers to help define for us what is right, what is correct, what is ethical, what is moral. If you do not have morality, you do not have Christianity. Some of our good friends that have made a disgrace out of grace are trying to teach our young people that it doesn't matter about how you react to authority. It doesn't matter how you react to... Uh, to morals, to righteousness, and it's commit fornication on Friday, repent on Saturday, and back in the choir on Sunday, as if immorality and ungodliness and worldliness has no consequences. But all the things of the world, unrighteousness, fornication, adultery, perversion, all of it has consequences. You make friends with mammon, you make friends with this world, you make friends with sin, then you have set in motion a tremendous 
and horrible thing. So, that's the first thing David struggled with. And not only he, but he brought the whole nation into focus. We will not let these people set the definition of our lives. We will not give them power over our destiny. Secondly, David had to wrestle with whether or not he could bring to bear his experiences. Let's put it this way. If he could reach deep into his memory and recall his experiences with God, his experiences in conquering the bear, his experiences in being able to yield his life to God, his divine spiritual memory, his spiritual memory. And, and we'll see how this plays out in the 17th chapter here. He had to be able to go back and take those infant experiences, those small experiences, and make them now applicable to a much bigger problem. So what that means for you as a Pentecostal is can you take what happened to you at the night you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and spake with other tongues, can you pick that experience up and say, all right, now I'm going into the fiery furnace, I'm going into the trial, I'm going into the test, and I'm not going to take anything in this trial except Acts 2.38. I believe that is exactly where every church is at, every ministry is at, whether or not we have a memory strong enough and sacred enough that we can take Acts 2.38 into the 21st century and say, looking the devil square in the eye, this is who we are, what we believe, and we will not compromise. Not for a pat on the back, not for your academic robes. We won't compromise for your money. We won't compromise for political position. We were born in the fire. We're filled with the Spirit. We believe there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one way, one truth. Don't get weak on me now. So, I want you to watch for this. And you'll see it as it unfolds, I believe if the Lord will help me in the 17th chapter. Now we come to the third and final thing. And this was the greatest test of all for David, I'd like to propose tonight, that he had to get to the place where he could trust in something that was totally irrational. He had to make sure that the Philistines, are we going to call them Philistines or Philistines? What did you say? No, your choice. Philistines, he's going to help me read. Philistines, we're in agreement. How can two preach together except they agree? The Philistines. Is that what you said, Philistines? I slip sometimes and say Steins. No, let's say Steins. Don't mess with me now. Philistines. We don't let the Philistines step, set the definitions. We reach back and get old-fashioned memories. I wish we could bring some old-fashioned Pentecost right back into the 21st century. Some old-fashioned running the aisles. Some old-fashioned speaking in tongues. I wish we could throw away our little day timers and all of our little programs and just say, Come, sweet Holy Spirit, one more time and bless us. Move on us. Touch us. Somebody say, Yes. And then the third great question facing us that we'll try to dig out, and I know I'm spending a lot of time here, but I want you to understand that we're going to try to get to the same place. And I feel my challenge in the Holy Spirit tonight is to try to get you to the same place where David got, where he could do something totally non-rational. And that was face Goliath with a sling and a stone. That's non-rational. You can't get any more non-rational than that. So that's what we're going to try to do. Now, Brother Beckton, if you would, please come to the sacred desk. What a great man of God. Don't you love Brother Beckton? Cleveland Beckton. How many times has he blessed your heart and turned your life around with his preaching? One more time, thanking as he comes to pray for us. Oh God, our minister tonight has wet our appetites. And we sit expectantly waiting for the tremendous climax of this message that will stir us all and help us to be better than when we came. We thank you for what we feel right now in the Spirit. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen and amen.
Come on, come on, come on. Don't, don't be weary of worshiping the Lord. Here's an interesting quote from a book entitled The Death of the West, and I want to use it. The dechristianization of America is a great gamble. A roll of the dice with our civilization at stake. America has thrown overboard the moral compass by which the Republic steered for 200 years, and now it sails by dead reckoning. Reason alone without revelation sets our course. And in my opinion, this is not good news. All due respect to Al Gore. With his new book, you know, about reason and how we can save the planet through human reasoning. But wherever we've had great cultures, and I'm not trying to be so naive as to blast Western civilization, because Western civilization, somewhat founded on Christian principles, has provided the world a great positive atmosphere in which tremendous things have been accomplished. But reason alone does not reach the hearts and minds of our young people. You can't just take education and rationale and reasoning into the dark places of our society, into the tremendous conflicts that are in the minds and hearts of our young people and say, I've come now to just kind of give you an intellectual version of God. It's going to take power and anointing, passion and conviction. So I do believe we're in a great experiment. I do believe someone described America as in a free fall. We're in a free fall. We're, have, we have jumped out of an airplane without a parachute. And we're trying to do something that we have never attempted to do before, and that is to to tear down, to break down everything that is foundational to our country. These are serious times, and we do need preachers. We do need men of God. We do need our young people not to be afraid to commit themselves to the call. I know there's young people here tonight that have a call of God on your life. Don't be afraid to say, I'm going to answer the call and do what God wants me to do. So now, with all of that in mind, let's come now to First Samuel chapter number 17 and verse number 1. And we're, we're going to see if we can find ourselves and our situation. Perhaps you'll find your life and your ministry here just a little bit. How many want to do the right thing in your life? How many know you're capable of making some pretty horrific errors in your life? Come on now. I was asked to preach down in southern Illinois not too long ago, and I went down, and I was running a little bit late, and I called the person that was hosting, and I said, I'm going to be there. I think I'll be on time, but I'm running late. I want to make sure that I don't miss the turn. And so we went through the directions, and I said, now, where's the hotel? And he said, well, we don't actually have you in a hotel. We've got you in a bed and breakfast. There's some kind of deal going on in town. There are no more hotels in any way. We don't have very many good hotels, so we want you to stay in this little bed and breakfast. I said, fine, fine. He said, go down to the stoplight, make a left turn, go to the first block, make a right turn, and right there you'll see a great big white house, and that's the bed and breakfast you're going to be spending the night in. I said, fine, thank you. I went to the red light, made a left turn, went down to the first block, made a right turn. There it was, big white house. And so I, 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 I parked. Now, I don't know how to say this. You know, I know it's a mixed crowd. And it's a little difficult. I'm embarrassed to say this, but the story won't make sense unless I tell exactly. Well, let's just put it this way. I had been driving like a madman for three and a half hours, and I needed to use the the facilities. You got the picture? I wish. Now look, you froze right up on me. I wish we had some humor. Am I preaching to? What am I? Are you all manigans? Is there, are there any real people here? All right, so you, it's all right for you to smile. I needed to use the facilities in the worst sort of way. You got the picture. So I parked in the parking lot. I dashed up to the bed and breakfast, and there was a big screen door there, and it was open. And so, you know, I, I, I noticed a man was sitting in there and had a little light, and he was reading the newspaper or something. And I just dashed in, and I said, uh, would you mind telling me where the bathroom's at? And he said... Well, no, it's uh, right down the hall. And uh, so I turned to go down the hall. He's in a big leather chair, got a light on, reading the newspaper. He said, uh, by the way, you wouldn't be looking for the bed and breakfast, would you? I said, well, I sure am. He said, well, I hate to tell you, but this is my house. I had walked 
walked into a man's house. He was reading the paper in his leather chair and said, Sir, could you point me to the bathroom? I said, this is not the bed and breakfast. He said, no, it's next door. There were two white houses there, and I picked the wrong one. You've never seen anybody get out of the house so fast, back over to the bed and breakfast, did the whole thing again. Thank God I'm here. We're capable of doing some very foolish things. And sometimes we want solutions to the problems that we're in, and we think that we, with our great ability and our tremendous talent, can work it all out. But we cannot work it all out. And this is really what you're seeing, I believe, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. A whole nation frozen, locked down. They're in a great panic here, trying to figure out how they can meet the challenge of the Phil. What were we going to say? Philistines? Philistines. And their big, their big guy. They had a big guy on their team named Goliath. And how are we going to deal with all this? It was a life-threatening situation. By the way, do not think that what we're facing today is not a life-threatening situation. What we are coming up against in the 21st century, the homosexual gender, for an example, is a very threatening thing. I don't guess I have any real people here tonight. Come on now. It is a threatening thing. We have three major homosexual uh, churches in the state of Indiana. All are ex-apostolic backsliders. Every one of them. And they recruit aggressively. They recruit. They uh, stole part of our mailing list not too long ago. They recruit against Calvary Tabernacle. They show up at our music conference. And one of the boys was passing out uh, tracks. And, and so, uh, you all have to forgive me for this, but I grabbed him by the lapels and I pushed him up against the wall and I said, you may be the first man... I may be the first man you've ever met, but if you pass out one more of your tracks in this building, I will personally throw your carcass out of this building. Now, I don't recommend that. That was not the Holy Ghost. But I have to tell you, I felt pretty good about it anyway. Because somewhere you've got to let the enemy know that you're not afraid to take a stand. You're not afraid to preach. You're not afraid to speak. Remember what we talked about last night. Day and night you've got to preach. You can't ever quit talking. You can't ever quit preaching. You can't ever quit singing. You can't ever quit saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Somebody say, yes. yes. My daughter graduated. She uh, got her uh, BA or whatever it is from uh, some uh, Christian college, so-called Christian college. And we sat there through the whole ceremony and no one ever said, Jesus. They said, Lord. They said, God. They even put great intonation on it. God. Lord. That deep voice doesn't impress me. I'd rather... I'll tell you what. That Lord God thing. It's not near as powerful as a little squeaky voice saying, Jesus. Because that name is above every name. And whether you like it or not, or whether this world likes it or not, whether politicians like it or not, whether Hollywood likes it or not, the day shall come that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Oh, I wish somebody would help me preach. And the confession will be, He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Creator. Hallelujah. Somebody say, Yes. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse number 1. I know i got to get started. What time is it? I, no, I kind of need to know. Nine. Oh, my word. Help me. Brother Hunt's going to help me. Seven till. All right, when I asked you the time, you said nine. You took seven minutes. Of course, you know... But brother, you took seven minutes away. Tomorrow, when they get you up, I'm going to try to get seven minutes off your prison. Brother Prince said, oh, seven o'clock. We're going to go by California time. What did Brother Prince say tonight? He said something about we was going to hurry and get through with this service. Oh, he said we can't wait for the termination of this service. Did you get that? How would you like to be getting ready to speak at the Texas camp? And the district secretary gets up and says, we can't wait for the termination of this service. Now, I could understand if my wife said that.
Now let's watch this drama. This is, the curtain is coming up now and here's this drama. Now remember, I'm, I'm asking you to, to think with me allegorically three things that we're fighting for here. Definition, whether or not we can apply memory to our situation and whether or not we can get to the place where we can lay aside our own human reasoning and rationale and get to a state of non-rationalness. Read. Now the Philistines... Now, let's just kind of go slow here. Now. Everybody say now. Now. Don't live in a false reality. There's always a now. And sometimes people do not want to face the day. They don't want to face the circumstances. Now, everything God has for you is in the future. And I like, uh, I like going back and reminiscing, but there's nothing for the Pentecostal church in the past. You need to build on our foundation, but all the blessings, all the revivals, all the anointings are in the future. Everything God has for you is in the future. You cannot go back. Life is, life is like a river. It's just moving pretty fast, and you can't shut it off. And if some of you think that's not true, then you're not looking honestly in the mirror. So, let's say now. What was happening now? Read. The Philistines gathered together their armies. The Philistines gathered together their armies. Does that sound like the world? Have you noticed this? The world is getting very aggressive when it comes to their anti-Christian attitudes. If you go to the average bookstore today, like uh, Barnes and Nobles and uh, all of those kinds of stores, some of the biggest sellers, as a matter of fact, read the New York Times bestseller list, all of these atheistic books, books that are blasting God and they're bold. They're claiming that there's nothing to God and Godness and religion and all of that. And these are not just fringe books. These are bestsellers. The book, The God Delusion, for an example, is a bestseller. I think it made it up to number three or number two in the Amazon bestseller seller list. It's amazing. So here's the Philistines now, gathering their armies together. To battle. To battle. And we're gathered together. Going to fight. There are people saying right now, we're going to shut down Christianity. We're going to close down churches. That's what some of these hate crimes are about. I was in the Capitol building when the buzzer went off on the vote for hate crimes. I was with our local congressman. And uh, she was rushing out to go vote on that. And I knew she, she wasn't going to vote the way I thought she should vote. And I reminded her, I said, I just want to say to you, Congresswoman, uh, uh, Congresswoman, lady, that that is a very dangerous thing we're voting on right now. She said, I know, Reverend, I know, Reverend, but it's not going to affect the pulpit. I said, that's what you say. But there are many people that are gunning for the pulpit. This is a backdoor entrance to try to get not only conservative radio off the air, but also trying to get preachers to quit preaching See, the whole idea behind the hate crime, if somebody can prove that when you preach against homosexuality, that it causes somebody to do a violent act against a homosexual, then you're going to be responsible. And this is a very sneaky way. I know they're denying this is not going to happen. But why would they even have to talk about it? Why would they have to deny it at all? It's because it is a reality, ladies and gentlemen. And people that study these kinds of things are warning us that this is a serious juncture in America, especially as we deal with issues of free speech. So here are the armies of the Philistines getting themselves all together, and they're coming to battle. Watch this now. Gather together at Gather Shoko. Together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. Now watch this. And pitch. they're coming together in a valley that belongs to who? Judah. Taking the battle right. This is this is right in your face. Coming. I, I can't stay here very long. But don't think that the enemy is going to be scared just because you speak in tongues a little bit. Or that they're going to be frightened because you say we're against you. It's going to take more than that. You're going to need the help of God in these last days. Your family. Your family needs more of the Holy Ghost, not less Holy Ghost. We need to be in church more, not less. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We ought to have the biggest camp meetings we've ever had and the biggest revivals we've ever had. And we need to be winning more souls than we've ever won before. Clap your hands to the Lord now. They pitched the battle. Go. Next verse. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side. Now we're... What verse are we on? Kind of three. call the verse. Verse 3. Now, let's watch this. And what happened? The Philistines stood on a mountain. They stood on a mountain. On the one side. On the one side. And Israel. And Israel. Stood on a mountain. Stood on a mountain. On the other side. On the other side. And there was a valley. And there was a valley. Between them. Not much. A thin veneer. A valley. 
a conflict was gathering here, a storm was gathering, and it was being pushed upon the people of God. I doubt seriously if they wanted this fight. Just like I doubt seriously that some of our poor preachers and some of our churches really want to be uh, filled with contention. And we certainly don't want a fight. And we just want to get along. But this is not an age when you can compromise. You can't assimilate into this culture. You can't say, I'm going to somehow just get along with folks. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not you can take a stand against unrighteousness, false doctrine, false teaching, false spirits. The question is whether or not you can lift up a banner. The question is whether or not you can reach down and get the torch and say, for as long as I have strength, I'm going to lift up this torch and declare that there's none of the name except the name of Jesus. There's no way except this highway of holiness. Somebody say yes. So there was a valley. That, that, is, that is the reality here. It's a valley. Just like in verse 1, they came to the place that belonged to Judah. The devil will get in your space. He'll get on your computer. He'll get on your phone. He'll get in your life. A valley was between them. A veneer. Kipling, the great Indian writer, said in his book, The Jungle Book, talking about the jungle and the terror of the jungle, and how quick people could clean out the jungle, clear off the jungle, and the rains would come and the jungle would grow right back up. And he had a tremendous line. He said, How near the jungle and how thin the veneer. How close the jungle is and how thin. You know what I see happening in many of our holiness churches? The veneer is getting thinner and thinner. The valley is between us and death. The Philistines were not gathering here to have a picnic. They didn't want to have a party. They didn't even want to have church together. They came to kill. They came to rob. They came to destroy. They came to take away from God's people. Now I know this sounds like isolationism or whatever you want to call it, but I'm just trying to tell you what I feel in my heart. You can do whatever you want to do with it, but I do believe we cannot let the devil set the definitions for us. I'm telling you, the veneer is very thin. I, I was called over to a friend's uh, a, a church, and I want to tell this story. It isn't a, a UPC church, although the same thing has happened in many UPC churches, I'm sad to say, or former or ex-UPC churches. But this man told me, said, Pastor, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my whole concept on holiness and righteousness, and I've decided to do it on one night. I appealed to him. I said, please don't do that, you know. It's just, you know, you need to pray about it, but it was all in vain. And on a Sunday night, he got up and said this, something to this effect. He said, folks, I've been preaching holiness and righteousness and all these kind of standards. He said, but I'm not going to preach them anymore. I don't even believe it's necessary. We need to reach the world and all of this kind of, you know, you've got to... The buzzword today is progressive Pentecostalism. It's like progressive philosophy or progressive theology or process theology or process uh, psychiatry or or process theology. Oh, is, you know what they mean by that? That there's no particular destination. All that matters is the journey. All that matters is that you're just trying to find God. Because really finding God is impossible. So it doesn't really matter what uh, kind of feelings you have toward the Bible or toward the Word of God because we just always are in the process of learning more and more and there's no absolutes and you can't just put your finger on Acts 2.38 and say we're going to stop right here. We have to kind of go on. Watch that buzz language. It's very dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. Because the philosophers say, well, you know, there's really no truth. We just do the best we can. And what is true for you is true for you. And you're okay and I'm okay. And we're just all kind of in this stream together. This stream of human consciousness and spirituality. But we never really reach a destination. That is a lie. Jesus is our destination. And there is a tower. There is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous runneth into it. There is a place where the weary can rest. There is a home. There is a destination. There is a name. There is a body. For by one spirit are we all baptized into... Oh, I wish somebody help me preach now. Into one body. Don't tell me there's not a right and a wrong. Don't tell me there is no definition. See, it's a... It's a trick of the enemy to make you think that nothing is absolute. Nothing really matters. 
how thin the veneer, how quick some people can just cross over to the valley, walk over and say, let's shake hands here and be friends, and we'll all just learn how to get along. How are you doing? What's your name? Hey, nice to meet you. Uh, Goliath, God bless you. Brother Goliath, nice. Nice to have you here. What's your name? Homer? You're one of the big Philistines, understand? God bless you. I'm going to vote for you next year. Don't worry, bud. You know, I'm on your team. Hey, how are you? God bless you. Let's start a... You and I get a pizza hut going. Amen. All right. Good. It is quiet. Yeah. All right, we better go on. Now, the Philistines are down here for no good. They're in a valley. One side, one side. All right, let's go to verse 4. And there went out a champion. You see, the enemy always has champions. This is a little problem that we have right now, in my opinion. This is all off the editorial page. I didn't realize I was going to be so editorial until I started preaching, and I feel very isolated at the moment. But, you know, I'm here to tell you, we're in a great fight. We're in a great battle. And right here is where one of the, one of the big things is. They brought forth a champion. A champion is a champion. This was a guy that had won some medals. This is a guy that had been in fights before. This was the big guy. This was the big wheeler dealer. This was the guy with the big charismatic church. This was the guy with the big program. He saw all the, he sold books and tapes and CDs. You got the picture. This is Goliath. You have to be careful who you admire. I'm just one person. Don't try to pick up on what I'm saying. I'm just here to tell you how I feel about it. Because I think if you come as far to preach as I have come, you should be controversial. Just to make it interesting so you have something to talk about. But I want to tell you, our apostolic young people need to get their eyes off the so-called champions of this world, media types of this world, Hollywood types of this world, rock singers, gospel rock singers, Christian rock singers. Get their eyes back on the true champion, the true Lord, the true Redeemer, the true Savior, the true champion, the captain of our salvation. And do you know his name? Do you know his name? So the Philistines send out their champion. You know, I always love this when churches turn to Hollywood and try to get in all the flashy types. I remember back when Roy Rogers and Gail Evans and Trigger was going to church trying to get people converted. Does that date me? Young people don't even know who Roy Rogers was. And get Johnny Cash. You got the picture. Get Goliath. I love preaching that sermon. David never even called him a giant. Not one time can you find where David ever referred to him as a giant. Because in David's mind, he was nothing more than just a Philistine. And his God was greater. I wish we could get some old-fashioned faith that says, Don't send us down some big old guy that you think is a champion. Because when it comes to the championship, when it comes to fighting for the trophy, when it comes to winning the prize, we've got a champion that is above all champions. A God that is above all gods. His name is Jesus. So they said, don't admire the world. Don't admire the world's champions. Don't admire the world's things. Is this all right? Read, Brother Hunt. Had a champion. Out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He was a big... Boy, somebody said his helmet weighed 150 pounds, his spear and his shield. I mean, this was a massive TV personality. This was a massive political system. This was a massive pluralistic system. This was a massive religious system. This was an, a massive, a massive ecum, uh, ecumenical system. I wish I had somebody helping me now. All right, verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those now, words... you get focused on the words of the enemy. You're going to get that sinking feeling. Here is despair. First of all, they're letting the Philistines make up the definitions. They're letting the Philistines decide where the battle is going to be. 
just like some of you. You've let the veneer get too thin between your church and your family and the world. You need to widen that gap just a little bit. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. You can call this holiness preaching if you want to, but I want to challenge you one more time. You need to remain separated from this world, committed to righteousness. Remember, without righteousness, you don't have Christianity. The one great testimony that the church should be able to give to this world is we have overcome. Once we were lost, but now we are found. Once we were blind, but now we can see. Glory to God! Glory to God! Glory to God! Glory to God! Can somebody say, He set me free. He changed my life. I don't drink anymore. I don't go to the places I used to go to. The things I once hated, I now love. And the things I once loved... When you start getting all your sermons from the Bible bookstore, you're in trouble. Begin to admire. And you're going to become like the thing you admire. And notice here, verse 11, read it again. Or just read it. When Saul and all Israel when heard Saul those words. And all Israel heard of, the words of, the of Goliath, of the Philistines. They were dismayed. They were what? Dismayed. They were what? Dismayed. When you don't, when you let the world define who you are, and when you cannot, as I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute, when you can't cough up your own spiritual biography, you don't know who you are, how you got here. Could I tell you, you didn't just join the church, you were born. If you're in the church, you were born again of the water and of the Spirit. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Not because you chose Him, but because He chose you. So, the same thing that happened to them will happen to you. They went into what? Brother Hunt? They were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed, they went into despair, and they were greatly afraid. If there's one sickening thing in the whole world, it's an apostolic that's afraid to be an apostolic, a Pentecostal that's ashamed of his Pentecostal message and his roots. Come on, get rid of all of that fear and unbelief and uncertainty and rise up and sing. Tell the whole world about this. Yes, we have been baptized in Jesus' name. And yes, we speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave us the utterance. And there is no shame. There is no regret. There is no turning back. Yes! Yes! I was at the general conference where the superintendent of the assembly, God, all due respect, please, I'm not trying to bash anybody. Somebody talked about it today or last night. I was there, heard him say it with my own eyes, my own ears, saw it with my own eyes, and heard him say that unless the AOG got back to preaching about Pentecost, that they were just a few years away from ceasing to be a Pentecostal church. How can you be a Pentecostal church? He argued in a sermon. Sister Mooney, you could have heard a pin drop. 40,000 people assembled together at the arena in Indianapolis, Indiana. And you could have heard a pin drop when he said, how can we say we're Pentecostal when we do not speak in tongues? When only 20%, 18% actually, of the new converts in our church are actually receiving the Holy Ghost. That means over 80% are not speaking in tongues. He said, how can we call ourselves Pentecostal? Challenging question, is it not? And it's a question, God forbid, that we should have to start asking ourselves. All right. Dismay and fear. What verse are we going to go to now? 14. Verse 14. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. Now, we have this... And we should call him Little David. If you go to verse 42, which we won't have time, you'll see there the Bible describes him as but a youth. Which is a great, great signal for all young people. Because it doesn't matter if you're a teenager or a child, God can still use you. You're not out of the mix. And can I just tell you young people this? You don't necessarily have to wait for some older person to tell you it's all right for you to be godly and holy. Just go ahead and live for God, even if mother doesn't approve or dad doesn't approve. And don't let this world set the agenda for your life. 
Somebody say yes, 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 yes. Here comes little David. Not only little David, but a man with a different point of view. First of all, he's not afraid. He's not dismayed. And secondly, he's not influenced by the definitions. He recognizes the fact that there's just a valley between he and victory. The veneer is thin. This is not a game. This is real. This is really real. This is a tough battle. This is a tough moment. I don't want to belabor it here. But littleness, smallness, youthness, immaturity, it's no problem with God. As a matter of fact, we should never limit God in any way. And if you're waiting to be strong enough, wise enough, rich enough, righteous enough, you're limiting God. You're limiting God by saying, God, you can only move to the degree that I'm able to present to you enough credibility for you to work in my life. And God says, I don't need credibility working in your life. I can take you just as you are. And what God is trying to do here with David is to get him to the place where he's totally irrational. You can see the struggle here. He's but a youth. But he is a man with a different point of view. He's not a man looking for negotiation. He's not a man looking for dialogue. He's not a man looking for some kind of compromise. He's standing out there and saying, this is a disaster. And I am not afraid to take a position that says, I will not bow. I will not turn back. I will not... Oh, I wish I had some old-fashioned apostolics here now. Come on, Texas. If you have a revival at all, it better be an apostolic revival or it's worthless. Numbers mean nothing unless we're filled with the Spirit. Yes, 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 yes. So here's little David. Now, let's move on quickly. Verse number 37. We'll, no, no, verse 21. David. Verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines... For Israel... Put, Israel and the Philistines... Had put the battle in array. Had put the battle in array. Army against army. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you sure it says that? I want to double check that. My goodness, it does say that, doesn't it? For Israel and the Philistines... Now, not just the Philistines, but somewhere in the course of these hours... In the course of these days, in the course of all of these unfolding events, here's David pondering all this, trying to work his way through it, trying to figure out. And I believe David had that kind of like mysterious, strange kind of grip inside of him. Something inside of him was saying, this is crazy. This is really crazy. I'm crazy. There, Everybody's crazy. There's only a valley between us and those Philistines. And they got a champion. And we're scared and filled with dismay and despair. But here is the shocking thing in verse number 21. They are going ahead with this as if it is somehow going to work out. Read that again so we got it careful. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Yeah. This, uh, Israel was involved in this? Israel. These guys are nuts. Saul and his henchmen are completely whacked. They're afraid. They're in dismay. They're challenged by Goliath. They don't have a clue. But they go ahead and launch the armies. They put the armies in what? Array. Now that takes time. They got them in position. They sharpen the swords. They Whatever they do. I believe David was looking at this and going, Oh no. Now, this may be my last time ever to preach in Texas. But I'm going to say what I feel right here. I believe that any one of us who thinks that we can go up against this world army against army, university against university, businessmen against businessmen. You like to think about Jerry Falwell. It's a tremendous thing. Liberty University is a tremendous thing. But don't forget Bill Bright writing checks. $50 million at a whack. Satellite against satellite. TV against TV. Radio against radio. Hollywood against Hollywood. We'll make our own movies. Somebody said we'll make our own movies. Army against army. I'm in so deep now I cannot get out. God help me. What am I doing? I understand perfectly well I'm not supposed to preach like this, but I'm going to tell you, army against army is a bad idea. 
It is not the right thing. It just don't make sense. It is an incomprehensible thing to even think for one moment that somehow we are a match for this world, army against army. And yet, the Bible says, read for me, would you please, preacher, that Israel and the Philistines put both of their armies in array. Here is Saul, frightened, dismayed, filled with all kinds of consternation. And yet he says, go ahead, suit up everybody. Get your swords out. We don't have anything else to do. Let's just go up against them. Give it our best shot. If we die, we die. Ladies and gentlemen, that is crazy. Completely nuts. Well, so much for that. Brother asked me, what was the text going to be? And I said, let's call it army against army. Now, the, But I want to say, I'm not trying to drag anybody into what I'm saying right now. But army against army, is that a good idea? Personally, I don't think so. Do we have an alternative? Let's go to the next verse. We David. Got, wait a minute. We got this little kid. He's but a youth. And he's pacing back and forth. First of all, he doesn't even recognize Goliath has been nine feet tall or however big he was. He doesn't care about a 150 pound helmet. He's just pacing and thinking. What in the world? All right, let's go. Verse 37. David said, moreover, David the Lord. Said, David said, wait a minute. Moreover. I, I, moreover. I, moreover. I believe I can hear the Lord speaking to me right now. The Lord. David said, moreover. The Lord that. We need to get that sentence going right. David said, moreover, the Lord that. That. Delivered. Now, I don't know exactly how we got into this. But maybe somebody said, what do you think, David? And he's going, well, uh, here's what I think. Now that you ask me, I know I'm just a kid and I came down to bring some pizzas and stuff like that. But the Lord that delivered me. Read. Out of the paw of, the, of lion, the paw of the lion. And out of the paw of the bear. Out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me. I believe He will deliver me. Let me go up and fight. Is there not a cause? Let me go up and you... I just don't think this army against army... Let's just go up as we are in faith. And I believe that the God that delivered me from the lion and from the bear... Read. Will deliver me out will. of the hand... See, the question I asked you will. last night, when Jeremiah got to that point, and God, he said, God, how am I going to do this? You put me against everything. And God says, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. Here's David at that same point. He said, I had to go out against the bear, against the lion, and I had to trust God. But do you not know God delivered me? And that God, that, now here it is, folks. Here's where your memory, here's where David had to say, I've got to think back now. This is a different situation. But I wonder if I can carry my experiences. I wonder... I went to a meeting one night and my heart wasn't right, but something got a hold of me. I was baptized. See, I believe oneness people have got to say, can we carry that old Acts 2.38 message down into that valley? Can we meet Goliath? Can we stand up against the vileness, the wickedness, the perversion? Is having the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues enough for our children? Is that good enough church? Or do we need to kind of see Africa? Theatric eyes are worship. Do we need to kind of Hollywood eyes are worship? Do we need to kind of, you know, get some kind of new program? Or can we just trust in that same old God? That same God that delivered us from alcohol, delivered us from drugs, delivered us from hopelessness, helplessness, that put joy, that God that put running in my feet, that caused me to... <laughs> hey! Can you go back and get it? Can you go back and get it fired up one more time? I love my father-in-law, Mickey's dad. He was a great man. He was a layman. But he used to stand up. The service would be going pretty good. And Brother Johnny, people always knew. Brother Johnny, when he stood up. And Johnny Harden, what a tremendous man he was. He founded the church 
that Carol Magruder's father pastored and later Carol Magruder pastored. They went into this little town and uh, Windfall, Indiana. There was no apostolic church there. They tried to go respectfully to the Pilgrim, Pilgrim Holiness Church. It didn't work. So they went into a little laundromat and started a church with about 17 or 18 little kids. And God blessed them. And every time old Johnny would stand up, his shoulders would and it was something about Johnny Harden when he got up and started shaking and he said I remember the night God saved me and you know what Johnny Harden was saying the God that saved me is the God that can keep me and the God that saved me is the God that can give us revival and the God that saved me is the God that can help us shake the culture minister to the world win souls turn cities Come on, apostolics. Stand with me tonight. How many believe we need to go back and get some old-fashioned apostolic Holy Ghost memory? When God filled you with the Holy Ghost, He gave you enough because He gave you Himself. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Clap your hands make a joyful noise. Now, here, am I making any sense? Here's the philosophical question. I think you may be seated that David was facing here. He said, well, uh, let's go back. Read it. Is it 37? He David said, said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear. Yeah. He will... Well, wait, wait. He didn't say. You know the God that... You know, I, I, I grew up in that little apostolic church. and We didn't have any air conditioning. It was hot. And, we had old funeral fans and I got the Holy Ghost. My whole family got the Holy Ghost. But you know that's not enough for us today. We need something a little more sophisticated, you know. We need something a little more upbeat, something a little more fashionable. I know how I sound tonight. I know. Don't, 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 don't take this in some... Don't take, remember, this is allegorical. Everybody understand? It's allegorical. You need to make an application. This is applicable to where we are today. Because when you're faced with the memory, that old camp meeting, that old place where you got the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm talking about old-fashioned ways, old-fashioned this, old-fashioned that. I don't want to go back, bless God. There was a, a, a lady, old grandmother, that uh, they tell this story about in a song. It's a wonderful song. I wish I could find it. And her kids were talking to her. It was on Mother's Day. And they said, Mom, don't you miss... Wouldn't you like to just go back to the old days? Go back to the old times? And she said, Children... I don't want to go back to the old times. She said, come in here with me. And she took them in and they followed her in and they went in the kitchen. She said, you see that dishwasher there? I don't want to go back to the old times. Took them in the laundry room and said, you see that washer and that dryer? I don't want to go back. They opened up the garage door. She said, you see that nice car right there? I don't want... Have you ever, have you ever cleaned up after a horse? She said. Oh, I wish I had some real people in here. Are you a real person? You can't go back, ladies and gentlemen. But you can go back in your spiritual memory. And you can ask yourself what I believe is a very profound question. That same God that saved me, that same God delivered me, that same God that turned my life around, brought me out of darkness into His marvelous light, can that same God with that same Holy Ghost minister to me in this 21st century? Can it help me to set some principles, some standards, and some guidelines for this complex, mixed up world? And my answer to that rhetorical question is, Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. He's the same God. And if He saved you, He can keep you. Come on, church. We need to learn to depend upon Him. Clap your hands under the Lord. So, Brother Hunt, it appears to me that David had it worked out. He said, I thought about it. He, he no doubt had thought about it. He said, He will deliver me out of the hand of this. The same thing. He didn't say, you know, this problem's a little different. We've never faced this before. I, maybe we ought to take a little different approach to this. Maybe we, it's called the White House. Somebody see if we can negotiate. Maybe we can get some Assyrians over here and we make allegiance. You know, this is pretty big. You know, the lion is one thing, bear is another thing. You know, I may have gotten off a lucky shot. Who knows? Pentecost, ladies and gentlemen, was not a lucky shot. It was a life-changing moment for the whole of civilization. And Pentecost still works. Acts 2.38 still works. It still is the apostles' message. It is still the one thing 
that ought to be preached in every one of our churches every chance we get. Well, well, well. Verse 37. What you're seeing in verse 37 as I close is what I'd like to call the force of conviction. The passion of conviction. The vitalness. The vitality, shall I say, that comes from conviction. Without conviction, there is no vitality. And there is no strength. And all you're left with is to make. See, if you don't set your own definitions, if you don't figure out, you don't let, you don't let the enemy... Philistines walked right into a field that belonged to Judah. You know, let's fall stuck. I said, I quoted it last night. Paul said, I don't, I hear all these people, what they say. They have another gospel, another Christ, another spirit. And that what he said? He said, but I give them no occasion. I don't make room. See, I, I grew up in an old-fashioned bishopric system in which if you didn't preach just right, you would get rebuked and set down. I was set down for putting my Bible on the floor for three months. Brother Beckson, get your Bible up off the floor. I wish I had not done that. I just glanced down there and there was your Bible. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. I wish you'd had it on your lap. All right, let's do this again. I was raised in the old bishopric system. If you put your Bible on the floor, I got set down for three months. Look at Brother Beckson. He's got his Bible right up there. You know why? Because they taught us it was a sacred book. Now, see, this is called the sacred death because when you stand here, you have an obligation to preach the Word of God and to preach it right and to preach it under a holy anointing of God. (laughs) Sitting in a director's chair does not make you a better preacher. What makes you a better preacher is to get this Word in your heart and get it embedded in your soul. Pulling off your tie doesn't make you cool. It doesn't even help you to relate to this world. Our young people do not need another disco ball or some more spotlights. They need the Holy Ghost to come. Ah! Yes! 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 Here's a man with a different point of view. David's saying, army against army? I don't think that's a good idea. He said, let me go. You go. Now we come. What's the next verse on our list? Verse 38. 38. Read. And Saul armed Saul. David with his armor. Now here is the crucial moment when David, perhaps out of respect, who knows, allowed himself to be suited up in all this paraphernalia. This was the moment when David had to decide, wrestle with it. All right, I know I've made my boast, but now can I recall enough of God and find enough strength to reject all of this? Now, I don't know, but it's possible. And don't try to read anything into the Bible. Now, I'm almost finished. It's possible that David may have, at this moment, when plunged, he didn't want to take this step, I don't believe, but he was forced into it. He was plunged into it. There's some things that are just thrown at us. This, this garment, these shields, and this sword was just thrown at him, put this on, tossed at him, and perhaps came with temptation. And here is where David could have thrown away the Holy Ghost, God-anointed paradigms. He could have said, well, you know, this is a different deal. Maybe I do need a sword. What happened? And he put on a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. Yes. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David now, said... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Some people say, well, you know, maybe we need to put Pentecostalism in the context of evangelicalism. Maybe we need to put it in the context of ecumenism. Maybe we need to be a little bit more, you know, generous in how we... Uh, define our position and maybe be a little less exclusive be a little bit more open to new ideas and get a little bit more into progressive theology and kind of you know it's not so much 
about absolutisms and to just say that you must be born again. Well, that is kind of bizarre, is it not? And anyway, we can't really trust in all these translations and we don't really know what the Bible is about. We're not really sure who the apostles were and on and on and on. And it goes in scholarship and intellectualism and academia just takes over your life until pretty soon you are in dismay and sore afraid. And then somebody said, army against army, let us go. And David said, wait, you... I can't let you do this. I'll go. And now, they just won't let this man alone. And they try to encumber him. But he does somehow find the courage to say, I have not proved it. it. I don't think this is a good idea. Just let me go out. And now we come to this great and wonderful traumatic moment. And I hope I've still got enough of you with me just to finish. And I'm so sorry. I'm sure Sister Mooney's coughing over there. I just can't hear us. Sad to be so far away from my helper. We come now to verse 45, and we'll close. Then then said David to the Philistine. Now they're out there in the field. I'm not going to try to dramatize the whole story. You know about it. They're out there, and now they're face to face. And this whole thing about army to army, he's put all that aside. He said, look, I'll just come out here. And uh, he says to the Philistine. Thou comest to me with you a sword. You come to me with a sword. And with a spear. And a spear. And with a shield. First of all, I don't even think you're a giant. I think you're pretty ugly, actually. And I don't have any respect for you at all. And plus, you don't have a clue who I am. And I already know who my God is. And as far as I'm concerned, and, and, and you read your Bible very closely, you called him an ugly name. This was no this was no ordinary man. He he called him a real nasty name. He said, You mean diddly squat to me. He said, I could care less about you. And you think you're big, you're not so big. Compared to my God, you're nothing. And he said, I've worked this out. He said, You almost had his trick, you almost had his trick, army against army. But look at me, I'm just coming at you. I'm just a little boy. Coming at you. Read, brother. But I come but to I, thee. But I, you come to me with a sword and a shield. But I come to thee. Come to thee. In the name of the Lord of hosts. In the name of the Lord of hosts. And you know the rest of the story. Somebody ought to put your hands together and thank God for a man that worked through. He worked through the definitions. He called up his memory of what God had done for him. And then he decided, I believe I'm going to do this God's way. And he reached a point of complete non-rationality. Now what my challenge is to you as apostolics is for all of us to reach the point of non-rationality. To put aside our wisdom, to lay up our talents and say, we don't have much. But we do have this old-fashioned back to Acts chapter 2 experience. And we're just going to go out there and do what Brother Cornwell tells us to do. And just keep praying for people, laying hands on people, and teaching Bible studies. And please don't distract us because we really believe this works. And we're just going to keep knocking down big giants and just keep on building churches and having revival in Africa and South America. You go on, do whatever you feel like you got to do, but just excuse us, please. Uh, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Have you received the... Let me through here, please. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Hey, would you like to be baptized in Jesus' name? Would you like to get saved? You look like somebody needs the Holy Ghost there. And just keep on keeping on. Stand with me. That's my little sermon to you tonight. And I trust that you will understand that left to our own devices, ladies and gentlemen, we will fail. Left to our own devices, we'll get so lifted up in ourselves that even though we have a little fear, a little consternation perhaps, we'll say, all right, army against army. We can do that. We can't do that. But we can go forth in the name of the Lord. I like to hike. I hiked up uh, in the Tetons two years ago. Sister Mooney and I went out. We were back at the Tetons just last week. I didn't go back to this place, but uh, I didn't have time. I thought I wanted to do Death Canyon. Death Canyon is a, an old 38-mile trail that goes across the Teton Mountains. And it was uh, the gold, the gold uh, rushers used that years ago. And that's how they got across the Tetons. And it's a, it's a beautiful hike. And it goes up, down, up, down. And I was only going to go in a couple of miles. I had a pretty good map, but I violated all the rules. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say. 
I didn't take enough water, didn't take enough food, I didn't take a pure, water purifier. I uh, underpacked in every way, didn't take any protein with me because I was only going to go in two miles. But I was so enchanted by the beauty of the canyon that I kept walking and I thought, well, I can do another mile. And before I knew it, I was four and a half miles in, one of the most spectacular places, big waterfall shooting out of the side of the mountain. It's just wonderful. But by the time I got there, I was completely exhausted. The temperature went up to about 70 degrees in the mountain, which was very rare. I was completely soaking wet and I had dehydrated. I drank my water. I had one little jar of water and one Diet Coke, but it was not enough liquid to re-liquidize or re-hydrate my body. And so there I was. And I tried to walk out. I knew I needed to get out. The sun was going down. And uh, uh, I could walk from about here maybe to that post, and I would cramp up. I got huge, as your muscles will do. I'd have to rub my legs. I was completely alone in the wilderness. I wasn't even registered. Sister Mooney didn't know where I was at. I'd walk another 50 yards, 50 feet, rub myself down and try to get moving. The mistakes I made going in was the thing that almost cost me my life trying to come out. Now, I'd like for you to think about this. The mistakes we might make going into the 21st century are the mistakes that can perhaps kill us. And the big mistake that I feel led of the Holy Spirit to talk to us about tonight, and I hope you took all this allegorically, but whether it's your ministry, your church, your life, you cannot go up against this world army against army. You've got to get out that little sword, that little axe, or that little a sling, and that little axe 238 stone, and you've got to put it in there and just keep saying, this is what we tried, and this is what we tested, and we know that it changes lives, and it changes behavior, and it changes character, and it puts in new hearts and new spirits. That's why all of us are here, because we went to a meeting one night, and God filled us with the Holy Ghost. Clap your hands to the Lord. And here's the point. Here's, here's, here's the point. Brother Becton, if I had not been in the wilderness, not having a candy bar would have been no deal. Not having enough water would have been no deal. I could have stopped at a convenience store. I, I, I could have just driven around the block. But when you're in the wilderness, everything changes. The circumstances changes. The danger is different in the wilderness. Mistakes have more consequences in the wilderness. The Pentecostal movement is going into a dark wilderness. I don't mean us as an organization, UPC. Please don't, don't read this the wrong way. I'm saying that there is a cloud of gloom and darkness and sin and perversion coming over this country. And we're, the consequences of our worship, the consequences of our prayers, our actions, what we do, how we live, how we think, how we preach, are going to be very severe because the times. But where sin doth abound, the grace of God doth much more now, I'm probably out of order, forgive me, but I'd like to do something tonight. Call it what you will, but for lack of another name, let's just have an old-fashioned consecration service here. And let's just come forward and say, one thing I do know, God can keep us. Would you just come and stand with me up here?